So, uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Asian Genetic Oncology Society uh, webinar series. Today is uh, number three, and uh, today we are going to talk uh, something which is uh, very important, which might just give you maybe a peep into the role of a geriatrician uh, in geriatric oncology as such, and uh, that is on uh, assessment tools in geriatric oncology. So, uh, talking about that today would be uh, Dr. Joita Banerjee. Uh, so, she is a, a geriatrician who is currently based out of uh, Dehradun. Uh, she has she has done her PhD uh, in geriatrics, and her topic itself was geriatric oncology. So, uh, over to you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Thank you, Prem, for the introduction. I think I lost my net in between. So I'll just start sharing my screen. Yeah. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. If you can make it full screen, it will be better. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And yeah. So should I start? Time is premium, yeah. yes, so please. I think yes, I should please. start. Please start. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. So today's topic is assessment in geriatric oncology. And um, this is a very important topic and there is a lot, there actually is not a lot of consensus about the assessment methods. There are, uh, we have got lots of guidelines and we are trying to follow so many, but there is no one size fits all. So I'll try to um, explain how we can go ahead in assessing our geriatric oncology patients. So starting with my first slide. So the older adults are the fastest growing uh, segment of the population. And um, it is thought that it is predicted that by 80% uh, of the older adults will be residing in the low and middle income countries like India. And as we all know that age is the... Uh, greatest risk factor for developing cancer and persons 65 years and older uh, account for 60% of the newly diagnosed cancers and 70% of mortality from cancers. So we will be seeing more and more of older cancer patients in our practice, more so in the LMICs. But the issue is the advances in geriatric oncology care delivery has mostly happened in the high income countries. Geriatric oncology still is in the nascent stages in most of the LMICs, including India. So what are the challenges that we face? First of all, it's a very heterogeneous group that we are talking about. Older adults are a heterogeneous group. No two old adults will have, you know, same characteristic. They might be, even if they are same age, they might be having, uh, they might be heterogeneous in terms of physiological reserves, comorbidities, or a specific geriatric, a specific, uh, um, geriatric syndromes. And... I read an article which was, uh, um, you know, the title of the article was Cancer Rarely Travels Alone in Old Age. And it's really actually so true. So compared to an younger adult who can come with a, a diagnosis of cancer without any other accompaniment, we cannot expect that from an older adult. The older adult will, will come with a diagnosis of cancer and many more things that we need to be, we, we need to take cognizance of. And, and the assessment is therefore very important, um, uh, not only for the cancer, but for all the other uh, age-related uh, issues that the person might be having. So, neither chronological age alone nor performance status scores does justice in characterizing this heterogeneous uh, heterogeneity in this group. 
And to top it all, there is underrepresentation in clinical trials, especially if they are frail with comorbidities or functional impairment, they're never uh, involved in the clinical trials. So what we are doing here is we are extrapolating the results of trials in younger adults, which may not be correct uh, to apply on the older adult. So treatment decisions in older adults with cancer are not straightforward, and therefore, this is a case for geriatric assessment and management. It is an extremely useful tool to guide, guide decision making and um, outcomes in geriatric oncology. So coming to the Indian scenario. So we see how um, aging is, uh, 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 how uh, the population is aging in India. By 2031, there will be about 100.9 million uh, females Older adults above 60 and 92.9 older um, males above 60. The females will outlive the males. And on the right side, we see that with increasing age, how the cancers are increasing. And um, uh, in males, it is increasing exponentially. But in females, maybe after 75 years, it does uh, slow down a bit. So coming to the basics of geriatric oncology. So here we have two specialties. One is geriatrics, one is oncology. In oncology, we usually stage the tumor. We start with the tumor, the pathology, the imaging, the performance status, goals of care. In geriatrics, we try to stage the aging process. We start with the patient. The, we see how functionally they are active or not, how, what all accompaniments do, do they have? Do they have morbidities? Do they have geriatric syndromes? So we have to do these assessments and there is also a shared decision, decision making. In geriatric oncology, we have to do this, these two together, staging the tumor and aging. So here, the assessment, the geriatric assessment and management is very important. And we will be talking about the comprehensive geriatric assessment and the screening tools uh, in, our, in the next slides. So this is the, uh, in a typical older adult, this is the, uh, these are the challenges that we might face. Not only are there physiological changes in all the organs of the body, starting from the CNS, the respiratory system, cardiovascular, digestive, bone, kidneys, liver, skeletal muscles, there is a slowing down of these physiological reserves, but there are other things like comorbidities that we have already spoken about, psychological distress like anxiety or depression, reduced organ function leading to increased risk of toxicities and complications to treatment, comorbidities leading to polypharmacy. Polypharmacy, again, there might be interaction of different medicines. There might be um, a potential, um, there might be errors or reduced compliance, nutritional deficits, cognitive impairment, functional impairment leading to more of, um, uh, uh, more of, um, you know, um, dependence on caregivers, caregiver burden, lack of social support. As uh, people grow older, they, there's more of isolation, there's lack of social support. Altogether, this leads to a reduction in the quality of life. So these are all the issues that can be faced by the older adults. And the challenges that we face while uh, caring for an older adult with cancer. And so the heterogeneity. So we have here, we are showing the two ends of a spectrum. Either they, they, either they can be fit or they can be frail. And in between, there will be different stages of vulnerability. And depending on that, uh, the goals of treatments also differ. So for a fit person with more life expectancies, less comorbidities, good functional status, more of organ reserve. So the focus will be on survival. But for a frail older person, we have to focus on quality of life. And in between um, the people who are in vulnerable state, we have to do proper geriatric assessment to understand their functional age and treat accordingly. 
So under versus over uh, treatment, this is always an issue while treating an older adult. As, uh, as um, um, mentioned earlier, since we have uh, very less older adults in clinical trials, we do not have uh, much to guide us. So always for the treating physician, there is an issue of uh, uh, fear, whether either they, you know, either there might be an under or an over treatment. And when we are treating uh, these two um, ends of the spectrum, either the robust or the fit uh, patient, there is always a risk of uh, under treatment, whereas in a frail or unfit patient, there is a risk of over treatment. So use of less intensive treatment in the older adults who would otherwise derive a greater net benefit from more intensive treatment or not providing non-oncologic interventions to deficits in geriatric domains, regardless of what therapy is chosen. This is under treatment. On the other hand, over treatment treatment of cancer in an older patient that would not likely lead to symptoms in remaining lifetime or intensive treatment in vulnerable older patients in whom there would be a greater net benefit from less intensive therapy. So, but our, the bottom line should be, they should, uh, while treating, there shouldn't be no harm and there is a, there has to be a fine balance and we should not tip on either side, either over treatment or under treatment. And the bottom line should be maintaining the quality of life of the patient. So here we start with the geriatric assessment and management. So the holy grail or the cornerstone of geriatric medicine is a geriatric assessment or the comprehensive geriatric assessment, which is a, uh, which is a multi-dimensional interdisciplinary diagnostic process focused on determining a frail older person's medical, psychological and functional capability in order to develop a coordinated and integrated plan for treatment and long-term follow-up. So, um, simply speaking, it is, you know, there are specific domains that we need to focus on in an elderly. And these uh, domains are usually associated with worse outcomes. And we have a collection of validated tools with which we assess these domains. And these uh, assessments need to be incorporated in the geriatric oncology assessment protocols. And only assessment will not help an intervention and follow through is required for optimal results. And best results are made when these tools are also compatible culturally and regionally. On the right hand side, you can see that the assessments can be physical, socioeconomic or environmental, functional, mobility, balance, psychological, medication review, all these issues which are very important in an older adult. And these assessments after being done, there should be a creation of a problem list and there should be a personalized care plan that has to be made. Interventions have to be done and regular follow-ups should be done. Then only can we call it a comprehensive geriatric assessment. Usually in geriatric oncology, um, the, the problem with comprehensive geriatric assessment, the, um, you know, the uh, flip part is that it is a very long run process at least 60 minutes to 90 minutes uh, uh, is required for a comprehensive geriatric assessment, which might not be uh, possible in a you know, busy um, uh, clinic. So, but we do need to do a geriatric assessment. So there are a few uh, very popular screening tools in geriatric oncology. And um, though these tools cannot replace the geriatric assessment, at least they can pick up the vulnerable domains in an elderly patient so that we can focus more on those domains. So the main uh, tools that are used very popularly are the geriatric eight or the G8, Vulnerable Elder Survey, West 13, the triage risk screening tool, the Gronin frailty index or the uh, abbreviated CGA. So there are a host of screening tools that can be used in a uh, geriatric assessment protocol in an oncology clinic. This is a very busy slide and um, uh, because of want of time, I will not go through it, but these are all the domains of the geriatric assessment and the tools, the validated tools we use for these domains. Now, the practical aspects, how can we use a geriatric assessment? So in an oncology clinic, in addition to the standard oncology assessment, um, the minimum geriatric assessment that can be done, the minimum, um, uh, the domains that we should look into is the functional domain. We have to see whether the patient is uh, independence. We have to see, look for independence in ADLs and IADLs. If there is a fall history, there are comorbidities unintentional weight loss to understand whether there is a nutritional deficit, social supports very much required when uh, uh, drawing out a care plan for an older adult with cancer, the timed up and go test, 
an objective physical test and a cognitive screen. These all domains can be looked into uh, with the, um, uh, the tools, the validated tools that we have. And for systemic therapy, we can use the screening tools like the geriatric aid or the West 13 tool. And then we can stratify our patients in these categories. The fit and the frail are on, the, on both the sides of the spectrum and the vulnerable in between. So for a fit patient, with no abnormalities can go for a standard treatment, whereas a frail patient who might be dependent on their activities of daily living, who might be having severe comorbidities um, or cognitive impairment for them, we have to consider supportive or palliative care. It is the it is the patients in between the fit and the frail who need uh, more um, more. Um, proper assessment and reassessment and modified treatment protocols, reduction of dosage, and we can also consider standard treatment if improvements are there with intervention. So this is a practical way of doing a geriatric assessment in an oncology clinic. So coming to the updated recommendations of ASCO in 2023, ASCO recommends that all patients with cancer aged 65 years and older with geriatric assessment identified impairments should have a GA guided management included in their care plan. GA guided management includes using GA results after doing the GA geriatric assessment, after we get the results to inform cancer treatment decision making as well as addressing impairments through appropriate interventions, counseling and or referrals. Basically, along with the oncologic treatment, we should also look at the geriatric assessment results and incorporate them in our uh, care protocol to make it more holistic. A geriatric assessment should include high priority aging related domains like already we have discussed the functional domain, the physical and cognitive function, emotional health, comorbid conditions, polypharmacy, nutrition, social support. These are very important domains in an elderly uh, cancer patient. The panel also recommends a practical geriatric assessment, which is a combination of all the validated tools of the different domains, also a screening tool, a chemotherapy uh, calculation, uh, either a CARG or a CRASH uh, chemotherapy calculator, also a, um, you know, a life expectancy calculator, uh, either the Lee or the Schoenberg tools. So these are the updated recommendations uh, from the ASCO meetings. So how, what are the models of care and where do we fit in? So, you know, there are different models of care. We can have a geriatric oncology unit, which is the ideal situation where we have an oncology unit at, or clinic and we have a geriatric, uh, we have geriatric expertise also, say an academic institution where a geriatric department is there and we have geriatric expertise. Or we have a geriatric consultation team, an oncology unit, but they can outsource for a geriatric expertise. They can send their patient for a geriatric uh, uh, assessment to uh, the experts outside the um, uh, oncology unit. And the last one is the geriatric expertise is unavailable, which is in most of the cases we have this. We don't have um, geriatric expertise available because geriatricians are a handful. And thus we need to uh, build up our task force. We need to um, uh, train people in doing this geriatric assessment, at least the uh, screening part, so that um, you know this can be their expertise can be uh, um, can be um, uh, used uh, while uh, doing the um, general oncology um, um, workup. The geriatric um, uh, tools might be used or a screening might be done to look into the different domains which are of importance. Now, coming to this tool that we had developed, uh, the Scope C uh, version one tool. This is uh, one of the tools that we have developed on Indians on the uh, on our patients and also validated on the Indians. It is a prognostic tool where we have developed a cost-effective care plan. So to assess fitness for standard treatment irrespective of age. So we have scored this tool and above a certain score, we consider the patient fit and can go for standard treatment and below a certain Certain, uh, low score, we consider that the patient is frail and should go for palliative and supportive care or end of life um, communication or care. And in between is the score where they are where the vulnerable patients are there, reassessment and tailoring of treatment should be done. So this uh, this um, tool was um, uh, 
uh, made, uh, keeping in the you know resource constraint uh, in other LMISs in mind, and um, to avoid unnecessary use of resources and enhancing the quality of life of the patient too, and. These are, this also has gender specific cutoffs, keeping in mind the gender disparity in care in cancer in um, in most of the LMISs, not only the LMISs globally, also there is uh, gender disparity in cancer care. Currently, we are trying to validate it in uh, different cancers in breast, lung and head and neck cancers and, and it is being updated to its second version too. So coming to the end of my slide, what should be the suggestions to take it uh, take uh, and the way forward? There should be advance, advancement in research and more of evidence building. Integration of telemedicine in geriatric oncology is something very important. Telemedicine enhances access to specialized care for elderly cancer patients remotely, ensuring timely intervention. And for people who might not be able to access care, telemedicine can be a boon. We have seen it during the pandemic that, yes, telemedicine can be very helpful. Utilizing palliative care for symptom management. This is very important. Palliative care, it has been seen that is being used minimally. So palliative care should be used and it should be it should start as soon as the uh, uh, diagnosis of cancer is made in the older adult so that uh, so that it can alleviate symptoms and improve the quality of life. Advocacy efforts in geriatric oncology. Advocacy plays a crucial role in raising awareness and we need to raise the awareness. So once, uh, once the clinicians are aware of the needs of the geriatric population, um, they will be more open to utilize the geriatric assessment tools and geriatric assessment methods in and incorporate, it, incorporate them in their oncology practice and enhancing collaborations with other global and regional leaders and um, global bodies in the field so that we can take the field forward. And I would like to end here so that we can go ahead with the program. Thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you very much. Shreem, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jyotas. So, uh, I mean, I want to welcome Dr. Purvish, who is obviously the chairperson of our uh, case discussion. So a few words before we go ahead. All right. Thank you, Prem. Uh, first, I must congratulate uh, Joita for giving a very uh, broad uh, uh, overview of what can be done in geriatric assessments and why it is important. Joita, I had a question for you. Uh, where in your assessment would you consider or take into consideration what the patients and family members or caregivers expect out of the treatment that we are giving to them? Um, that's a very important question, Dr. Parik. So when we were actually making the tool, we had the last few questions which were which were actually asked to the patient only. We were asking the patient about the support system. But oh. I am so sad, and this is a this is a lacking of my tool that we have not involved caregiver burden, or you know uh, we have not involved caregiver somewhere in the tool. So that needs to be done, and maybe in the next uh, versions we can think about it. But this is all about the assessment of the older patient, um, uh, uh, taking into account all the domains uh, that are important in um, you know, in older adults. Uh, including the support system. Um, uh, that's so how it your is. tool, your scope C for geriatric assessment is great. And I don't think we should add caregivers assessment into that one. We can have a separate one for the caregiver. Yes, but we my, should have My question was that supposing our geriatric assessment says that a 74-year-old uh, male patient with acute leukemia is fit, but he says that I want treatment. What I expect out of treatment is X, Y, and Z. Then I think we need to factor that into whether it is quality of life or whether it is cost of therapy or whether it is convenience of coming to the hospital or not. I think yeah. a, a separate assessment or documentation of expectations Yes. would also help in the geriatric population. So that was what my question was. For yeah. I think that's really very, uh, very thoughtful and very great. What the patient wants. Yes, we need to um, incorporate that. 
So and, many times, uh, especially for elderly patients, there's a conflict between what patients want and what the primary caregiver wants. True. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? So you you see, we can make so many algorithms and tools, but it is the clinical acumen and the uh, interaction. No, no, no. Sorry, with the I did. Uh, maybe I did not clarify my question. Patient okay. says, "I want the best treatment." And the caregiver says, oh, this fellow is too frail. Uh, he will not be able to tolerate the treatment. Only give him painkillers. Now, that is a common factor that happens in day-to-day -day practice. So I am asking you, in your practice, how do you deal with this conflict between the patient and the caregiver? Um, this can be done with, uh, done, this is a very common thing. This can be done by communication alone. And um, maybe we can talk to the caregiver and make them understand that if, the patient really wants it. We need to give it a try. And somewhere, you know, Dr. Parikh, mostly we have seen the other way around. Um, it is uh, sometimes mm -hmm. that the caregiver wants and the, most of the time and the patient doesn't want. So, so true. So true. It yeah, happens so both we, ways. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would now hand over back to Prem to carry on with the you. panel discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Purvisa. I think one of the important things that was I just highlighted was goals of care. So I think goals of care are not always from the clinician's point of view. The goals of care are from the clinicians, the caregivers and the patient's point of view. And I think that needs good communication before we obviously embark on treating older patients, especially older patients. So uh, welcome all uh, uh, to the panelists. Uh, Dr. Jyotir are a part of the panelist. Dr. Pradeep Behel, who's a geriatrician uh, from Pune, and he's done some very good work. I know him from... Uh, uh, my Delhi days, uh, Dr. Jovita Martin Daniel. Uh, she, uh, I met her very recently in one of the ICON conferences, and I was very happy to know about her interest in geriatric oncology. And uh, Dr. Rajat Saha, welcome, sir. You have obviously been, uh, if I have to say, you were one of the first few people who had interacted on the online platform along with Dr. Purvish uh, in one of our online conferences. Uh, when we can talk, when we can say it was the beginnings, uh, that was in late 2020. So, uh, thanks for being a part of uh, this particular panel discussion. I'm going to be presenting a, a case, and uh, you'll obviously have your views on how we should go about treating the older. Okay, so this is basically a case of a, a locally advanced lung cancer. It's a 65-year-old with no comorbidities, no addictions, presented with a two-year uh, two uh, history of cough with occasional with occasional hemoptysis, asthenia, history on exertion, dull left-sided chest pain. The outside CT chest showed left upper lobe uh, six centimeter mass, and the PET CT showed uh, left lo upper lobe mass, which was of uh, 6.7 into 6.4 into 5.8 with prevascular lymph node 3 into 2 centimeter. So CT guided biopsy shows uh, NSCLC favors squamous cell carcinoma. MRI brain showed no brain meths and it was for performance status 2. So if you see the case diagnosis per se, it's a 65 year old patient with PS2 with uh, T3. Uh, T0 and M0 squamous cell carcinoma of the lungs. So let me come to uh, Dr. Saha. So, I mean, if you have to put in the NCSN guidelines, so what would you want to proceed as far as this particular elderly person is concerned? So, uh, yes, uh, uh, she has a comparatively lower performance score probably because of her disease, because of her dyspnea and exertion and everything. Uh, uh, we haven't got any uh, much information on your uh, slide as regards the comorbidities. Does she have any significant comorbidities or does she uh, is she on any multiple uh, drugs for her comorbidities? So that is an important thing which we generally take in on, uh, on our first clinical visit. Do we have any any comorbidities? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I will be elaborating a bit more on the assessment part. I mean. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So, uh, uh, as far as the uh, treatment is concerned, this is uh, we should ideally go in for uh, uh, either uh, concurrent chemotherapy and radiation therapy as the first modality of treatment. That is as per the book. But uh, uh, mentioning that she is a PS two patient, 
uh, their uh, catch lies that I am I, I would be little uh, wary of the side effects of the concurrent chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, uh, nowadays, we also have an option of uh, uh, chemo immunotherapy. So uh, definitely this case will go into a multidisciplinary tumor board where we'll be discussing with our surgeons. We will be assessing the pulmonary function test of the patient just to assess the pulmonary reserve and uh, whether the patient is op operable or inoperable. And uh, uh, then uh, definitely the uh, plan of action would be either concurrent chemo radiation or if the patient is of borderline performance status, then as in this case, then we would probably go for a sequential uh, chemotherapy followed by radiation therapy on the line. Okay, just to just to retreat, the patient has a PS of C. Mm. Just to mention, yeah. So uh, the yeah PS of two means definitely uh, she may not tolerate the concurrent chemotherapy radiation therapy protocol. Nowadays, we also have options of. Uh, uh, chemo immunotherapy combination so we will definitely sure, sure. also further uh, do the pdl1 assessment it's, uh, it's the pdl1 assessment just to see for the eligibility for uh, immunotherapy and if immunotherapy uh, she is eligible for immunotherapy then we would like to add on immunotherapy to the chemotherapy so that's another treatment option which we can do chemotherapy plus immunotherapy sure sure Okay, Dr. Jovita, uh, would you want to add anything to what Dr. Rajat has already spoken? Actually, I would uh, agree with Dr. Rajat. Uh, the only point where I would, uh, uh, I just need to have the HPA1C for this patient because most of these patients who are slightly on the older side, they will declare and say that I don't have any comorbidities. And finally, when you really go and probe into them, they will be borderline diabetic and that will complicate the whole issue. So that part of it, I would want to know. And also, um, as Sir said, you know, sequential, obviously the results will not be enough. But looking at the performance, it looks like that is a way to go. Or we could have a concurrent chemo radiation instead of a dual chemo, we can just have a single agent chemo. Uh, so that would be a better choice. In that uh, sense, um, I would opt for a NAP Packley, which is better than a, a conventional Packley uh, taxol. Okay, so I mean, as our oncology friends have just mentioned, uh, it was obviously discussed in the multidisciplinary tumor board, thoracic oncology board, and evaluation of the scan revealed the rank primary was bulging into the chest wall, the ref phrenic nerve, and the first pulmonary artery branch were involved. So plan for definitive concurrent chemo radiation. The patient was seen the medical oncology clinic and referred for the geriatric assessment. Uh, so let me get into uh, the geriatricians here. I'll start with Dr. Pradeep here. Uh, so as far as uh, frailty is concerned, one of the very important, I think, scales, uh, which is uh, the Rockwood frailty scale. How would you want to interpret this scale as far as this particular patient is concerned? Uh, the thing is that, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Prem. I uh, just wanted to say, uh, yes, uh, you can see that you have written the Rockwood clinical frailty scale. It is 2 out of 10. That means the patient doesn't have any active disease. But frankly speaking, as Dr. Jovita Martin Daniel also said, that the patient might have a underlying pre-diabetes or a pre-hypertensive stage. Those things are also important to be noted. Because when we are going to start the treatment, it is going to make a difference into the treatment. Another point is, uh, which I felt so uh, with this uh, frailty scale, uh, it is not only the clinical frailty scale, there are other domains which has to be checked. So it is just a, it, it's just a subjective uh, assessment. When we are doing the clinical frailty scale, the other better scales are available in the form of Advanten and other scales. We should go into those scales more uh, because they'll be covering more domain than the this is just a subjective assessment sure sure so i'll just as as dr pradeep just said uh well of course so coming on to the proper assessment along with the other things so a g8 was done which was 13 a west 13 was done which is zero the geriatric syndromes uh there weren't a lot of them to be very frank uh as far as the vision was concerned, it was good corrected vision and hearing was not impaired. So 
as far as the Edmonton symptom assessment scale is concerned, the person obviously had pain, was tired, there was no nausea, vomiting, anxiety, drowsiness. Feeling of well-being was also around 4 by 10 only. So, uh, Dr. Joita, uh, I have to keep sort of telling the names properly. I don't want to create any confusion. So, our yeah. <laughs> Dr. Joita, our, our geriatrician. So, could you could you just comment on the Edmonton symptom assessment scale? I think ma'am is maybe away. So I'll just I'll just yeah. tell uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Pradeep, you can continue uh, with this. Uh, yeah. yeah. So look at, can you hear me? My yeah, yeah. Internet... So could you please comment on this uh, Edmonton symptom assessment scale? Yeah. So feeling of well-being also somewhat uh, compromised. Otherwise, not too much tiredness is okay. But we should look at the pain scale now. Uh, we should look at uh, what uh, uh, we can do for the pain component. Uh, so that the feeling of well-being is, uh, you know, uh, they feel better. And appetite. We have to look into uh, these. Otherwise, shortness of breath, depression, anxious. All these things are fine. So mostly I would, at this point, I would uh, look at the pain and the feeling of well-being. Why? So I think, I think maybe the multiple symptoms feel. which are there, that is pain, tired, yeah. tiredness, yeah. appetite tiredness. and feeling of well-being yeah. are all affected and maybe they're all, all interrelated. Up. So for example, and pain might be one of the biggest symptoms. Symptoms. And we need to assess all these with communication sure. and trying to find out what is the issue there. So quickly, just going through the background, general data is married, lives uh, with husband, secondary school education. She's a homemaker, resident of UP, currently living in a guest house in Mumbai. Her son is a primary caregiver. He's accompanied by him. Uh, she's accompanied and height and weight as specified. So BMI is 20.81. Uh, unintentional weight loss is unknown. MNA screening is 10. Full MNA is 22. And mid-arm circumference is 22. And mid-calf circumference is 30. So, this is how the MNA sort of looks. So, I mean, before I before I go into our oncologist further down, uh, a comment, Dr. Pradeep, on the MNA that the older adult had, and how do you interpret it? So you're on mute. Yeah, as you can see, the uh, scale was uh, there. MNA scale is there with a screening test was 10 and the full MNA is 22. That means the patient has got uh, patient has got some bit of in indicators that he the patient is at the uh, malnourished patient and if the score is less than 17. But if the score is between 17 to 23.5, that patient is at the uh, risk of yes. malnutrition. So are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that is there. The patient is already malnourished uh, and maybe because the history is also there that the uh, patient had a asthenia and uh, other pain. These are the co components which make uh, the person uh, eats less with that. And because of the loss of appetite with the ongoing disease because of the cancer, the person is likely to have uh, weight loss and it is going to lose uh, weight. And uh, that will happen. That uh, will cause uh, the problems when we are going to treat the patient fully with the chemo radiation or any other curative intent treatment. Okay, so okay. I mean, uh, one of the very important components is functional assessment. So as we see, uh, the first, uh, the older adult, she is independent in her activities of daily living, and even in her uh, uh, instrumental activities of daily living. So both are. Independent. So, if you have to put the function in completion, uh, her ADL is uh, six by six. Her ideal is eight by eight, which is good. I think the glaring thing which all geriatricians will look up was will be the tuck. So, the tuck was around six point seven. Although she is not using a walking assistive device as well, her cognition is twenty five by thirty. Her Charlson's Covert Index is zero, and her SERS G is one, which is okay. So. Uh, Dr. Joita, just a quick comment on uh, maybe the MMSE and then Dr. Pradeep on the tug and then we can go ahead. 
Now, overall, I think the patient is quite um, fine in all these functional scales. Only thing that already Dr. Behl has already uh, told about it, I would rather uh, focus on the nutrition part before yes. the patient goes into the cancer cachexia. We should, yes. uh, uh, we should, uh, you know, um, uh, plunge in there and give the supplementation and the counseling so to build up the patient for the chemotherapy or the chemo radiation or the treatment. Otherwise, I don't find. Um, even the MMSC is fine, you know, there is um, uh, 25 uh, on 30 is not that bad uh, considering our literacy rates and everything. So I feel the other things are fine. Uh, we need to look at more into the nutritional uh, part of it. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Bell, a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the uh, point which sure. Dr. Joyta said and I wanted to continue the point when the MNA was being discussed. Uh, nowadays, we have to go ahead with the uh, from the MNA. MNA is just going to tell you that patient is malnourished. But the latest guidelines, which is there in Harrison also, it says that uh, we have to divide this patient into etiological type and phenotype. phenotype. So etiological type will be because of the cancer or cancer, uh, cancer or any chronic disease per se. And phenotype is either it is uh, Kishorkar, Marasmus or mixed type. So that is very important now that we have to go ahead from that yes, patient is malnourished, but what type of malnourishment it is there? Subsequent to that, uh, assessment of macronutrient deficiency and micronutrient deficiency is also very important. So assessment, nutritional assessment is comprehensively done subsequent to that. MNA is a screening tool, I should yeah, say, in, in exactly. such a manner. Mm -hmm. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the assessment is required subsequent to that. And that assessment is required and mind you, the macronutrient deficiency that is a calorie deficiency or the protein deficiency is more as compared to micronutrients in our elderly people, which we have seen in our clinical practice. So uh, we have to understand that. Okay. So I uh, just wanted to say about the nutrition. I'm coming back to now uh, as Dr. Prem has said about the tug test. Yes, tug test in this patient is 6.78, which is quite a good. Uh, tug test, uh, the fall risk is less in this patient. And if we do a Q-tug also, it is going to tell us, uh, which we, which we, it can tell us what type of uh, assessment, uh, because tug is going to tell us the only time. But uh, as we are using the Q-tug now with us uh, in our setup, it is going to tell us, uh, is there a problem in the acceleration, deceleration or turning back? So those are the points assessment also are going uh, requires more assessment in today's time. So TUG has uh, evolved from Q TUG to QTUG now in our setup. And uh, just to info to the all the uh, participants that uh, one of the dissertation of our department is on the uh, fall risk assessment by QTUG device in uh, uh, patient undergoing the chemo, uh, taking the chemotherapy from the chemotherapy centers. Can, can I just one point? put yes, some sir, comments? Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. So I'm very happy that the focus is on nutrition because I yes, think uh, it is very important to understand where the nutrition uh, issue is coming from. And uh, Sir also pointed out that uh, we need to distinguish between uh, marasmus and uh, you know sarcopenia. Is it there or not? Yes. Is it macronutrient deficiency yes. or not? Yes. Uh, one additional factor that I would consider is anemia whether it is uh, yes, sir. nutritional anemia versus cancer-associated anemia. And correcting that could also be very useful. Yes, sir. absolutely. That's it. Uh, just to add to, sir, uh, what we are seeing in our clinical practice is the combination of iron deficiency plus anemia of chronic disease. All right. Both the things are coming up. So okay. to, as, uh, as we saw a patient today, the MCV was normal, but the patient's uh, serum iron was low, TIBC was uh, was also normal. So the patient had a combination of iron deficiency plus anemia of chronic disease, both, sir. So as Understood. you rightly said, sir, the, both the things are coming up in our patients, sir. Thank you. Sir, yeah, I Dr. want to add one point here. Uh, I hope this is a slightly relevant point because you're talking about nutrition. Uh, we just need to know if she's the only member in the family who goes to the kitchen and makes food for yes, herself and for the family. So if that is the re uh, if that is a fact, then uh, if we have to improve her nutrition, then a caregiver who actually helps her to eat, uh, you know, should be there. So that way the caregiver, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, analysis and you know talking about the caregiver and in including that point into the scopus might be of relevance as uh, joita ma'am actually said now so i may just come into yeah, that point so yeah luckily she didn't have any medication which is quite yeah. rare but she didn't uh, psychologically she is okay, okay. Uh, she has a gds of 2 which is if it's if it's on a short scale it's bad but it's on the full scale it's okay then uh, social support she lives at home with family number of possible caregivers is around 4 her uh, caregiver burden was 26 but it was filled by the son who's obviously the primary caregiver so coming on to our oncologists uh, dr rajat and uh, uh, dr jupta uh, do you very commonly use the karsh tool and uh, i'm i mean you can see the results of the same here but would you commonly use the karsh tool and is it more of an indicator for you to change treatment or is it more of a guide for you to just decide yeah dr rajat and dr jupta Uh, we are frankly speaking not using the card score to decide the therapy we are generally still uh, in a in a busy opd we are still depending on the uh, performance scale the comorbidities the burden of uh, polypharmacy and definitely we definitely take the history of falls and all but yes and uh, as and when for deciding chemotherapy we are not using the I, at least i am not using the card score to predict the toxicity uh, dr Jim. what about you dr Def- uh, i'm also of the same uh, you know state as of now uh, so every time i'm i'm looking at the patient i would want in my mind the background of my mind to do the assessment but i will never be able to do because of the constraints of time but i think eventually this will change okay so i mean coming on to one of the very important points which sir actually already mentioned initially dr purbesh so the patient wants to know full details regarding uh, uh, the diagnosis and prognosis the patient has been told the intent of therapy is curative the patient stated a priority was complete cure from cancer so this is what the patient and relative expectations are so if if i have to just put the overall impression from the geriatric assessment the patient seems fit on geriatric assessment but i would want to say that i'm saying that purely because i want to highlight the next point according to me it's not fit because the nutrition of domain uh, the domain of nutrition is really vulnerable so a, a, an older patient who is nutritionally poor is never fit so what i'm trying to highlight is the overall genetic assessment might look good but we need to concentrate on the individual components a lot of things might be okay but that doesn't mean that uh, uh, the person is fit the caregiver burden is high Uh, predicted to be yes low risk for developing uh, chemotherapy but again uh, a lot of our oncologists might or might not use it to be very frank whoever i am working with the oncologists they might just see it as a scale which guides them maybe they would take sometimes try to maybe reduce the dose but not always because ultimately we have to sort of even look at the tumor burden which is very important as far as the patient's perspective is concerned okay so quickly going on to the questions is the patient malnourished i think uh, the patient is malnourished according to us but did not have access to a weighing scale in the past so does not know whether she actually has weight loss uh, she was a homemaker i'm sure she's been so busy in taking care of others that she obviously hasn't taken much care of herself uh, bmi is around 20.8 but in indians bmi more than 18 may be considered normal but again that is again very relative according to me we cannot just go by that uh then mna is 22 which obviously puts her at the risk of malnutrition and uh, again is the card score a reliable predictor our oncologists sort of have told that they don't necessarily use it but what the studies say that it is a good helpful tool but not necessarily the no all or end all it is not supposed to guide it is only going to be guiding you it's not supposed to predict that you have to do or you have to go by that what it indicates okay what interventions of the non oncological vulnerabilities would you want to recommend uh, dr pradeep and dr joita and then we'll have a final word as well from the oncologists yeah uh, you have written uh, dr prem you have written otherwise that uh, patient uh, had no osteoporosis and the fall there was no history of falls tug tax is normal but uh, i would like to keep the patient on a follow up for osteoporosis or osteopenia also in this case 
that's very important that uh, this patient may go into if the patient has uh, having an active disease and going into bony metastasis uh, then we have to think that patient might require uh, anti resorptive or uh, anti osteoporotic treatment so that is important that we keep that patient for this another thing is uh, non oncological vulnerability i felt so that uh, patient is from uttar pradesh the patient yes okay first evaluation has been done at uh, bombay but uh, because the caregiver burden is very high in this case and the most likely because of the son is a primary caregiver who is who is the maybe the only bread uh, earner for the family and he has left the job and uh, gone to the bombay uh, we have to uh, give them a choice to uh, after the chemotherapy a plan or radiotherapy plan has been done that the patient might be follow up at delhi or lucknow uh, which will be closer to the place and the caregiver burden might reduce because of that because he might be the only uh, as i said a uh, bread earner of the family so these are the things also has to be understood along with this a uh, patient may require a uh, follow up of uh, with, of a geriatrician after 3 months to see that uh, uh, is there any deterioration or uh, the patient is static for the same what we are doing in our setup is we are doing a fall risk assessment after uh, qtac test after th three months only after the three chemo uh, chemo cycles or six chemo cycles we do the uh, qtac test again yeah and i do i agree with uh, dr behel all the points that you have touched i was uh, uh, very concerned about the caregiver burden here and and as you said there is financial toxicity coming from uh, uttar pradesh coming all the way to mumbai staying there all the costs involved that might be his stress so you know in some way we can alleviate the stress by counseling or if there might be some support group which we might uh, um, try to attach him to or we might give our numbers we might give our phone numbers where we can tell or we can give uh, numbers to, uh, with our social worker uh, whom he can you know sometimes call and uh, get a little a little bit of relief so that caregiver burden has to be looked into because um, this is just the starting and he has to go a long way now so yes we have to look at it like caregiver and as i always say a stressed caregiver can never be a best caregiver so it will lead into a lot of burnout so i think we should look into the caregiver burden here so i think uh, one of the very important points is use your team you might have a medical social worker if you yeah. if you do have yes. one or you might have a geriatric nurse or you might have just a nurse use your members or maybe a research person to actually help you out as far as the caregiver burden is concerned and of course use extended services of the counselor psychologist which might be needed in this case okay coming on to dr rajit and dr jyotika in uh, not uh, in that order uh, the oncological treatment you would want to do now after getting all all the information through given the assessment So uh, yes, so uh, definitely a comprehensive geriatric assessment has been done. Uh, even though her performance scale is two, but she is found to be quite fit on the comprehensive geriatric assessment. So uh, this is this is a kind of a scenario where now after the comprehensive geriatric assessment, I would be more confident in probably choosing a more aggressive treatment pattern rather than a less aggressive treatment. In in my in my first statement, I was a bit skeptical. about starting uh, a more aggressive treatment pattern because of the ps and everything but now that she has been found to be a fairly fit person as per the tuck test and uh, history of falls comorbidities everything is good so i may be prompted to use a more aggressive treatment and definitely uh, uh, fitness is always dynamic so we'll be assessing as the treatment goes on whether how's the nutritional scale yes she was a little bit poor on that side how how does it improve or doesn't improve so yes so this is where the integration of geriatric uh, assessment and our oncological decision making comes into the picture uh, we may we dismiss certain patients are very frail and we may not we may deprive them of certain uh, good treatment uh, 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 and also against uh, uh, means uh, probably out of the scope of uh, this uh, discussion but uh, is this patient a smoker or a non smoker uh, any idea non smoker non smoker uh, non smoker so 
generally in an elderly population we as oncologists desperately try to find out as regards the uh, uh, the option of any oral drugs chemotherapy again we we try to avoid iv drugs in them so here uh, the patient being a non smoker squamous cell carcinoma female patient i would uh, probably subject the patient to certain molecular tests uh, to uh, sometimes we do find a targeted tablet therapy uh, which which uh, uh which can definitely uh, uh help our patient uh just to add uh, sorry uh, dr prem uh, because the patient belongs to uh, uttar pradesh we don't know about the financial status if she is from the rural background she might had a exposure to the chula smoke in the earlier age group when the Probably. cng was not there so we have Probably. to consider that point also along with this not only yes, the absolutely. addictions, chula smoke is also very important. Yes. Yeah, I mean, chula yeah. smoke is yeah. equally, if not more dangerous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Dr. Jubit. So, um, the nutrition part, I think uh, we can uh, have a nutritionist's opinion. Um, and uh, also, I would suggest that the caregiver burden, as ma'am said, was high and we could do counseling, but we'd also divide the uh, burden in terms of, uh, I saw the previous slide, there are four uh, caregivers. Yes. So we could probably ask one of them to come over to Mumbai. So when he goes in for work, the other person can take care. And uh, I think that will be the way to go. And a little bit of counseling uh, will go a long way because otherwise what happens in reality is uh, there are a lot of patients who suddenly get dissolutioned and they say, I'm, uh, we are stopping everything, especially the caregivers. Even if the patient is cooperative, the attenders will say, no, I, that's it, that's I'm done. So that kind of a situation should never come about. An oncological point of view, as I said, I think uh, the way to go will be CCRT. And uh, uh, the patient will do well if we are able to address the uh, issues which uh, were bothering us. Okay, so what exactly happened? Yeah, so started on concurrent chemo radiation and uh, from 2020 to three months. And then, of course, five cycles of Pakli Carbo. Uh, you had obviously mentioned about NAP Pakli, which is uh, sort of safer, and uh, followed by one cycle of full dose. Uh, Toxicity is hospitalized uh, for uh, E. coli pneumonia, grade 3 hyponatremia, grade 3 odanophagia, grade 3 neutropenia, grade 4 thrombocytopenia. Uh, required rovoplastin as well as plated transfusions. Weight loss was also there. Patient did well recover from all these toxicities and received the uh, maintenance terulubab. So again, as we say that when we actually assess, I think the biggest point of thing here would have been intervention, maybe simultaneously for nutrition. Uh, and of course, although it looks quite horrific all the side effects which might have happened but ultimately the patient did recover and sort of is uh, getting the maintenance removal. so let the geriatrician priorities we have to just put it uh, in a sort of uh, concise way management of pain I think management of nutrition uh, to address the caregiver burden absolutely uh, assess for cachexia then rehabilitation we use our team members again exercise physical therapy respiratory exercises fall prevention is very important and of course social care services because ultimately i think the caregiver burden is there uh, as dr jogita was saying although the number of caregivers might might be four but i am not very sure if caregivers even take turns because a lot of families we have seen the only one caregiver is the one who is always doing everything the other caregivers are there, but they're not necessarily doing everything. So, so just, just a last slide for the conceptual crossroads which we have. Uh, mobility, sarcopenia. So we know sarcopenia has reduced muscle function, reduced physical performance and low muscle mass. So whereas malnutrition is concerned, it is usually weight loss, low BMI, reduced food intake, disease burden inflammation and consequence of senior, serious disease, which is sort of cancer. Uh, so weight loss, low BMI, decreased muscle strength, fatigue, anorexia. So what I'm trying to sort of show by this slide is ultimately there might be three different things, but ultimately the core I, with three different definitions, maybe the core is that we actually have to make sure that nutrition is taken care of. It is ultimately uh, the one shot solution will be nutrition. So uh, that's about it as far as this case is concerned. Uh, thanks a lot to all the panelists. 
uh, we might just have maybe one or two minutes for maybe questions, uh, but thanks a lot to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prem and all the panelists. I think this uh, case-based discussion was absolutely fantastic. And it uh, brings out all the points which are of practical importance. Uh, nutrition being a very important focus here, and I'm glad that it was brought out by all the panelists. You, Prem, at the end, you also mentioned about sarcopenia. So in this particular case, was there sarcopenia or no sarcopenia? So in this particular case, there was there was sarcopenia, mm -hmm. but then again, uh, treatment of sarcopenia is a mixture of obviously exercise as well as uh, even uh, diet sort of supplementation, which was done in this particular case. Uh, the two other things that I felt are important is what was the cause of pain? Was the pain because of a geriatric issue or was it as part of the cancer because if the pain is uh, part of the cancer then it is easily reversible as the patient responds to the therapy and the second part that I thought was important was the uh, breathlessness and chest pain that you mentioned at initial diagnosis so I would yes, be sir. very sorry go ahead yes sir so so basically the uh, the the lung mass was actually sort of uh, on the phrenic nerve, number one. And number two, it was sort of into the chest wall cavity. So most probably the pain was because of the cancer. Right. And uh, the dyspnea part of it could also be because of cancer, but I would very much want to make sure that the cardiac status has been evaluated before we Absolutely. take any uh, decision on for the treatment. Yes, sir. So the so echo was some echo very was important this. learnings yes. for me from this uh, case. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. I, thank you. I feel, you know, the pain should be taken care of every time, even if it is little. At that time only, if we take care of it, it, it reduces a lot of anxiety and, you know, enhances the quality of life. Pain management is very important in all, right. all these cases. Absolutely. And I think pain is uh, directly proportional to maybe a lot of times how independent the older adult becomes. Because once they are pain-free, they become mobile and they become less dependent. So uh, thank you all again. I think we are coming to the close of this particular session. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, to see you, all of you very soon next month or so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.